Um, feel free, of course, I'm not monitoring the uh, YouTube chat right here, but when I take a break, I'll go back there and take a look at it and try to answer any of the uh, questions that you might have. All right, so novel anticoagulants, part one, uh, foundation. Here, I guess I could put my glasses on. I had him up here, I had him up over my head. You know, I'm really kind of jealous of Greg Gutfeld. He's got, he's got his 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 massive sidekick Tyrus, and he's got the program, the five, and a whole bunch of people. So I need some help here. All right, you guys out there, if you want to join me here, if you're in the local area and you're watching, come on down here to the office. It's really, it's a lot of to the studio. It's a lot of fun, and uh, I think you would really enjoy it. I also. Um, Stephanie, Stephanie Eboos, our manager here in Houston, I would be remiss if I didn't let you know that that company, Houston Extracorporeal Technologies, is hiring. So if anybody is looking to relocate and come to work with a group that's just a lot of fun, please don't hesitate to send your applications in. I, you could use that email or you could use Joseph Basha at HET.us. But for right now, I've done my due diligence. So Stephanie, you can't, you, I did what you asked me to do. And we're going to get started now on the uh, uh, novel anticoagulants. Okay, so DOOX in cardiac surgery. And they call them DOOX uh, because they can't really, you know, anticoagulant is really one word that I know of. But so it would be DOAs, uh, which really has a bad sound to it and a bad connotation. But I put the two arrows sort of banging into each other because I remember the days when Plavix was just being given for everything. And I want to kind of go over that and then doing emergency surgery on these patients or urgent surgery on these patients. So I want to start with a case. The case is a 68-year-old male. He's admitted to the ED with chest pain. ECG shows ST elevation. Cardiology is consulted. The patient is given either 300, and many times it was 600, 900 milligrams of Plavix um, are ordered, and the cath lab called out. They did this in preparation for the stenting, okay? Coronary angiogram showed multiple high-grade lesions. There was an attempt to stent the culprit lesion Coronary perforation occurred. Cardiac surgery was consulted for emergent five vessel cabbage, and the patient has ischemic MR, and they're going to do a mitral annular ring. It's Sunday afternoon, and the blood bank is depleted of platelets. What do you do now since? Plavix is irreversible for the life of the platelet. Well, this is what this is what I did many times. And this happened not too infrequently. So integralin only has a half-life of two and a half hours or has a half-life of only two and a half hours, probably a more accurate way to say it. It is reversible, but it's way more expensive because it never made sense to me. Why do you not start these patients on Integralin from the emergency room, get to the cath lab, decide what you're going to do, and then transition them from Integralin to Plavix? That seemed to make more sense to me, but best I understood... Uh, and if I'm wrong, please somebody let me know. But best I understood, it was just way more expensive. And that's the reason why they did not go that route. But common platelet inhibitors, aspirin, bersantine, those are the old days, Ticlid, Plavix, Integralin, Berlinta, and, you know, Berlinta and Effient are now the sort of new generation uh, platelet inhibitors for patients with uh, uh, atherosclerotic heart disease. And back in those days, we gave massive, massive amounts of platelets. Gave a lot of platelets to control that bleeding. And, you know, platelets, everybody knows red blood cells. Giving blood is bad. We all hear it. Blood is bad. Well, you know, that's not just red blood cells. Plasma, it's 
platelets. In fact, uh, platelets have a thousand times the cytokine load of baseline in a single transfusion of platelets, which is enormous. In contrast, the cytokine level is 15 times in red blood cells. So, you know, all of it's bad, all of it's expensive. You want to avoid it as much as possible. But listen, I mean, I've, I've I have depleted the blood bank giving platelets to patients back in the old days, which aren't that long ago. We're talking 10 years ago. And now with these new novel direct oral anticoagulants coming out, are we going to see the same thing? I haven't seen it yet, but are we going to see the same thing? You know, and I and while I was looking through this and researching this, I found some really interesting stuff out, um, and that is the influence of diet and nutrients on platelet function. This was really fascinating. So you can you can read it, but uh, it goes on to explain that CVD is a leading cause of death worldwide. We know that plaque that platelet uh, uh, activation and aggregation play an important role in hemostasis and thrombosis. Diets and nutrients play a potential role in modifying CVD progression, particularly in platelet function, which again, I'll show you some really interesting charts and have a potential for altering platelet function tests, which is another issue altogether. Diets such as the Mediterranean diet, which is high in omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids and vegetarian diets have inverse relationships with CVD. Well, we kind of knew that, okay? You eat more of those, you have less coronary disease. But dark chocolate, foods with low glycemic index, garlic, ginger, omega-3, onion, purple grape juice, tomato, and wine all reduce platelet aggregation. Dark chocolate reduces uh, 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 one of the binding sites and uh, 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 microparticle and platelet microparticle formation. Berries inhibit platelet function, uh, and uh, energy drinks have been shown to increase platelet aggregation, and caffeine increases microparticle formation. Therefore, repeat testing of platelet function may be required for those patients who are on antiplatelet therapy that do these things. And I think the point of all of this is that, you know, uh, diet and things that we eat are, are really inf influential in our coagulation uh, sort of uh, uh, a position or, or, or uh, our, our coagulation status, especially if we're taking them, but whether taking something or not. So let's, let's look at this graph. This is really interesting stuff, I think. So if you look over here, cocoa. Cocoa, I, I really thought this was interesting. Reduction in uh, arachidonic and acid-stimulated expression of active 2B3A receptors. Those are the same receptors that Plavix uh, 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 affects or alters. So 2B3A receptors. But you can read some of these coming all the way down. Coffee, um, reduced collagen-induced aggregation, so it reduced it, which was interesting. Um, here is energy drinks. Energy drinks actually increase ADP-induced platelet aggregation, which I thought was really interesting. Onions, I thought this was really something, improved postprandial flow-mediated vasodilatation. Basically what that means is after lunch or dinner, your flow-mediated vasodilatation is improved. So you have better digestion, you have better circulation. Basically, onions are good for you, right? And, uh, and I love onions, so I'm glad about that. I'm going to counter some of the other bad habits that I have. But this was really cool. I never knew red wine reduced plasma fibrinogen levels. White wine reduces ADP-induced aggregation. So they both reduce platelet aggregation, but I just never knew that red wine reduced plasma fibrinogen levels. So when you're given a bunch of cryoprecipitate, ask yourself or tell everybody, this patient must've drank a lot of red wine. It's not the sepsis. So coagulation factors, fibrinogen, factor one, factor two, prothrombin, you, know, you can read through these. I won't go through all of them. Uh, but you know what's coming, right? I know you know what's coming. Um, so let's, let's take a look at these 
And you can always go back and review this, of course, if you ever want to, but this is kind of a good thing to have. And then here's some fun facts about coagulation, where each of those factors is produced. And, um, uh, and EC being endothelial cells, right? So liver, liver, liver endothelial cells, liver endothelial cells going on, what the half-life of each of those factors is, and what is the appropriate therapy for when you uh, need, when you have a deficiency in one of those uh, uh, factors that you, uh, that you need to replace for whatever the reason may be. So there they are on the, uh, the right-hand side. So here it is. I knew you were waiting for this. The, 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 the great uh, 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 intrinsic and extrinsic pathways for coagulation. None of us, we all used to remember it. We all used to be able to recite it. We don't anymore, thankfully. But what's interesting about this slide, and again, you can download this off of our, uh, off of our presentation here tonight, is uh, that the heparins, which factors are affected by heparin? whether that's unfractionated or low molecular weight, but that's it there. The vitamin K agonists, which would be like warfarin, okay? So those are the factors affected uh, by that. Direct thrombin inhibitor, inhibitors, which would, I think warfarin, warfarin qualifies as a DOAC, but uh, really it sort of became more popular with the novel anticoagulants uh, like uh, Pradaxa, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor and you can see there what, what is affected by that right here. And then the uh, factor 10A inhibitors like uh, Xarelto and uh, Eliquis and those, those things there, and that's affected, that, that affects right here at the factor 10A, activated factor 10A. Now, calculating half-life, and why is it even important? Well, you know, we give these drugs and they do have a half-life. What does that half-life really mean? You know, we use it a lot. I mean, we talk about half-life of a drug all the time, but what does that actually mean? What does it mean to, that, that how long does it really take to get rid of something that has a half-life of two hours or eight hours or 36 hours? So basically, Half-life is how much time it takes for exactly one half of whatever compound it was, medicine it was, to be cleared from the body, whether that be through the liver or whether that be through the kidneys or whether that be both. Keep in mind, half-life is always going to be altered by renal impairment, hepatic uh, dysfunction, so you have to keep that in mind. Also is affected by absorption. How much, you know, when did they take it? What was going on at the time? Did they absorb it all? Whatever the case may be. Did they take it with food, not with food? Um, various different things. But when we give heparin, it has a half-life. And so we think, all right, we're just gonna let the heparin wear off as opposed to giving something. What does that really mean? How do we calculate that? How can we tell our colleagues in the operating room? Well, if you do that, you know it's gonna take about this long before you really start seeing any hemostasis occur. So let's look at these examples. Drug A has a half-life of two hours. If the plasma level of the drug given as a single dose is 1,200 milligrams per liter, what will its plasma level be at the end of eight hours? And you see the answer there. It will be 75 milligrams per liter. And what's important about that is there's a therapeutic level and there's a non-therapeutic level. Where is it in regards to when I'm not going to see an effect of this particular drug? So that's important to see how that's done. And it kind of shows you the formula. Take the, the first half life, two hours, first half life, you take the plasma level divided by two, then you take that divided by two, and it's a very simple formula. But we don't remember this stuff, you know? We don't think about it. Drug B has a half-life of three hours. That gets a little more complicated. If the initial plasma level of the drug given as a single dose is 3,600 milligrams per liter, what will its plasma level be 
after 10 hours. Now note, in this case, the time value does not coincide with an exact half-life interval. In other words, you can't take three and divide it into 10. That's basically what they're saying. So to do this, you tabulate the time and value for each half-life to the next higher time value interval. So you take three hours is one half-life, 3,600 divided by two, and you keep going down until you get to some point, but then you have to add back. So you wanted 10 hours, you had nine, you have 12, but you don't have 10. Easy to fix. Tabulate the times and values between nine and 12 hours. So it's one third and two thirds, since 10 hours equals nine hours plus a third of the interval to 12, the value will be equal that at nine hours minus a third of the difference time and value being inversely proportional. So then you calculate out the difference and there it is, 375 milligrams per liter. So you get your answer. Now, why am I showing you this? Again, take these things, have them, play with them. Practice. We're not trying to do a math class, but at the same time, a lot of science, a lot of medicine is math. And I think this will make you a better clinician to better understand how this formula works and being it, once you do it a couple of times, you get really good at it and you can just figure it out real quickly. And it's gonna be important. Right now, like I said, I'm not seeing a lot of these novel anticoagulants. I'm not really getting that, you know, I'm not seeing it in the operating room that much, but I think you're gonna start seeing it more and more. Now there's a reason I think we're not seeing it as much. Cost, I think is one of them. Uh, we could talk about that. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, Coumadin or warfarin is, you know, pretty well established and understood and all of that. But I think, you know, of course, with those patients, we can treat that. Um, but I think in time, we're going to see a shift of people being transitioned from that to these more novel anticoagulants or direct thrombin inhibitors or factor 10A inhibitors, whichever the case may be. And we're going to see more and more of them and I think it'd be better to be prepared for when that happens versus sitting here not knowing what to do. That's my view anyway. So example two, drug C has a half-life of eight. Well, I guess it's technically example three, but drug C has a half-life of eight hours. If the initial plasma level of the drug is given as a single dose, 4,800 milligrams per liter, how long will it take for the plasma level to fall to 180 milligrams per liter. Now note here, we are solving for time rather than value, okay? So we're not looking to see how much of the drugs there. We just wanna know how long is it gonna take to get to this now non-therapeutic range that I don't have to be concerned about what, uh, what effect it's going to have. So basically you do the same thing, which you see here, And then what you do here is since you tabulate the values and times between 300 and 150, since 180 equals 300 milligrams minus 0.8 times 150 milligrams per liter, the time will equal 32 hours plus 0 0.8 times eight hours, value and time being again inversely proportional. Time goes up, value goes down, value goes down, time goes up. So that's you know, what we're trying to say, what it says here. Now, what I really want you to do though is, you can get a pretty close idea. You can get a good idea just by doing this part of it. But to be exact, to know exactly, and I don't know how important that is, but I would be remiss if I didn't show you the second part of this and how you do it but it's published so you can download it again, you can look at it, you can do a couple of practices. In fact, I've got a little challenge for you as well. So then you calculate the difference. 40 minus 32 equals eight hours, equals 480 minutes, multiply the difference by 0 0.08, you get 384 minutes, which is six hours, 24 minutes. Add to the lower value and you end up with 38 hours, 24 minutes for your result for this particular one. So practice it, try it, see if it works out for you. In fact, two fun questions for you to win a prize. 
and they're easy. Drug D has a half-life of 90 minutes. If the initial plasma level of the drug given at a single dose is 2688 milligrams per liter, what will be the plasma level after eight hours? And yes, I did them and got the answer. Question two, drug E has a half-life of 16 hours. The plasma level of the drug given as a single dose is 512 milligrams per liter. How long will it take for the plasma level to fall to 24 milligrams per liter? Those are your questions. The answer when we return, so I've laid a foundation, and there's the, 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 the questions right there. If you answer correctly on the YouTube chat, you have to go to the YouTube chat, and you have to give me the answer. Just put Q1, Q2, what the Q1 answer, Q2 answer, and if you've got the answer, you get one of these very stylish perfweb.us cups that you can put your favorite coffee, tea, bourbon, whatever you want in it. And you can sit by the fire, it's winter time now, you can sit by the fire with the grandkids and watch me on your Perf Web show, because I know you're gonna be watching every single one of them, and you can each share in one. In fact, if you answer both questions, first person to answer both questions correctly gets two cups, everyone else gets one. So if you want one of these, start working on the math. And like I said, it's pretty easy, but I think it's important. But when we get back, I'm gonna give you the answers and then we're gonna go over each of these new uh, anticoagulants.